All righty. Uh, thank you all for joining on for this video. Um, so this uh, is meant to replace uh, the lecture from Friday, the 22nd of March, where I was at a conference. Uh, so the conference went, went really well. I got to uh, meet up with some old friends from uh, from grad school and bumped into some colleagues I haven't seen for a while and got some uh, deep dish pizza in Chicago. So lots of fun, right? And so, um, but now we're back at it. So this uh, video lecture is meant to be viewed any time before the next exam. So you have flexibility with that. Um, and here I'm just going to review some stuff, right? And so we'll look at some equations that'll be relevant. We'll solve some problems. Okay. Um, and so feel free to consider putting some of this stuff on your cheat sheet when you're uh, preparing for the exam and gearing up for that. Okay. So with all that in mind, uh, let's start by uh, thinking about some important equations. And I'm going to be uh, jumping back and forth uh, between this review document, which should be posted to Moodle, and this equation list, which should be posted to Moodle. So I'll, I'll confirm that, okay? So what are some relevant equations? Well, we can think about um, our ideas about quantity theory and about money. So I have some equations ready for us here. Uh, so when we think about quantity theory, all right, uh, we like to say that, um, Money, so the number of dollars in the economy, times velocity, the number of do times those dollars are spent, is equal to nominal GDP over here. P, which is the price level, times Y for real GDP, right? It's going to give us nominal GDP, which is the dollar value of expenditure in this economy. All right, so how much spending in dollar terms happened? That needs to be equal to the number of dollars times the number of times those dollars are spent in a given year, right? That's just a, almost definitional, right? But a useful equation nonetheless, all right? And now we can take that equation and we can transform it in a way. Uh, we make the dynamic quantity theory equation uh, which is the inflation rate pi is equal to money growth. So the growth rate of the money supply. So what percentage change is the Fed setting for our money supply? So this year we have a trillion dollars. Next time we have 1.02 trillion. So a growth rate of 2%, all right? minus GDP growth. And of course, that's growth of real GDP, right? Always growth implies growth of real GDP. And that's just something you know, right? We talked about that. Okay. So very powerful equation. Now, we can also think about where demand for money comes from, right? So there's all these dollars out there in the economy. And as that in-class experiment we did uh, would suggest to us, it's not a guarantee that uh, people will choose to hold dollars, right? And so we need to model money demand. We need to explain where it comes from. And our theory is money demand responds to two things. It responds to the nominal interest rate, which is the opportunity cost of holding money. If I hold money, well, it has an inflation problem, and I'm not holding bonds, which are going to return an interest rate as well. So uh, money loses for those reasons. It's worse than bonds for um, nominal interest rate reasons. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, money facilitates spending. And if I want to spend, I got to have it. And so uh, the amount of spending I want to do is going to be influenced by my income, big Y. So Y for real GDP, Y for income. So using our quantity theory, right, or those definitions for velocity, we could also equate demand for real balances, so 
real money here demanded as one over V times Y, all right? And so this equivalence here is really useful. That came up as a question on your homework. Okay. Now, um, we can also look at money from kind of the supply side, where money comes from. And we can measure money as either the money supply or the money base. And so we have a, a system of equations uh, that will help us tackle, uh, tackle some, of, some questions along those lines. And we'll do some examples in just a minute. So we know that the money supply includes currency and deposit. So M is equal to C plus D, where the money, I beg your pardon, yeah, um, pop-ups, yeah, yeah. Um, we know that the money base, so base now, not supply, but base, is currency plus reserves. Okay. So remember, reserves are money that's held by banks. It's not out there in circulation. Think about it as in the bank's vault, right? Though in reality, in probability, uh, those reserves are held with the Federal Reserve Bank, right? The bank deposits those reserves with the Fed. But think about it as in the vault. That works just as well. So it's not out in circulation. Okay. And now we have a relationship between the money supply and the money base. Big M, money supply, is equal to little m, money multiplier, times money base. All right, and so what is that little m? Well, um, in a very simple world where people don't hold any cash, little m would be one over the reserve ratio RR. But we can be a little more sophisticated. And so this little m, uh, when we consider the fact that people actually do hold cash, would be 1 plus the currency ratio over currency ratio plus reserve ratio, RR. And these ratios, uh, the currency ratio is currency divided by deposits, the reserve ratio is reserves divide, divide by deposits, right? So it's a ratio of deposits. Okay. And we see that down below, right? We see that uh, currency big C is equal to currency ratio times deposits. And reserve ra um, reserves big R is reserve ratio times deposits. Okay, so useful equations all, yeah? Okay, now we said that the nominal interest rate is the opportunity cost of holding money. And so sometimes we care about the nominal interest rate. We also said that people are motivated to save or invest, right, based on the real interest rate. And so um, what is the relationship here? Well, the real interest rate takes inflation into account. And we have two views on this. All right, we could be looking backwards and we say, okay, I know what the real interest rate is, right? I know that the real interest rate, R, is just the nominal interest rate that's in the contract right? minus the inflation rate that I observe over the past year, the one that's in the data. So that'll be my real interest rate. That's a perfectly fine way of doing our analysis, looking backwards, right? The issue is we might want to look forwards. And if we look forwards, we don't know what the inflation rate is going to be, right? So the ex post real interest rate is going to be a real is equal to nominal minus inflation. 
as observed in the data. So true inflation. Now, if we're looking ahead in time, our ex ante real interest rate is going to be the real interest rate is equal to nominal interest rate minus inflation expectation. I don't know what the real interest rate is, so I take a guess, or right? I take a guess as to what inflation will be. And this is my best guess, right? And so this thing still does have meaning. This ex ante real interest rate tells me the real interest rate that I expect, right? And that's important. More often than not, this is the one that motivates people's decisions, right? We have to decide whether to invest or not before the inflation rate is revealed, right? And so take that loan or don't, right? We'll find out what inflation is later. Okay. Now, uh, the addendum that I want to make, right? so there's one other um, equation in this chapter that uh, is probably relevant. So we also talk about unemployment in this chapter, right? And we know that unemployment U, right, uh, is equal to, well, the labor force minus employment, E, right? Um, so more often this would be written as the labor force is the unemployed U plus the employed E, right? So that would be equivalent. Now, um, we also know the unemployment rate, you divide by L. We did some algebra in class, and we found that this is equal to the job separation rate, the chance that I lose my job this year, divide by the separation rate plus the job finding rate, F. All right? So Sierra over Sierra plus Foxtrot. Yeah. Okay. And so this is going to tell me something about the natural rate of unemployment, right? It's where the economy is tending towards. Um, but as we know, there's a business cycle. As we know, um, you know there's different fluctuations. And of course, um, this, this equation isn't explaining where inflation or where unemployment is coming from. It just says this is where it tends towards, right? And so... Uh, we need to develop some theories to think about this further. All right. So those are the equations that come to mind. It might not be a fully inclusive list, so do look over your notes. And there might be other equations that you want to add to your, uh, your cheat sheet or go over in your review. But this is a good start. Now, this will be pretty helpful for the review to come. Okay. Now. Uh, let's do some examples. So first, um, and I think, you know, all of these would be decent exam questions. So these should be fairly representative of what you'll see on the, the coming exam. So first, uh, list the different historical and modern types of money and, uh, you know, give an example of each, all right? So um, barter is not money. Barter is the absence of money. Don't count barter, all right? And I'm just uh, checking to be sure that my microphone is, uh, is, is being activated and we look good. All right. So um, don't think about barter, but we could think about a very rudimentary sort of money, commodity money. So commodity. Commodity money. And so we could think about specie, like uh, for, for commodity money. Gold and silk, all right, uh, were often used as money. Um, in some places, as we mentioned in class, salt is used as money, right? Uh, uh, in prisoner of war camps, maybe cigarettes or canned fish, right? So these things have intrinsic value, even if we don't use them as money, but we do, right? So, so um, also keep in mind that in the modern world, gold is not money, right? We don't use it as money. You know, it has value, it's used as jewelry, it's used in electronics, it's not used as money, right? And so something we need to be careful of. All right. Now, um, 
going further in time, uh, we have commodity-backed money. And so think about the gold standard. Think about the pound sterling, right? So, so the pound was backed up by silver. And so um, commodity-backed money uh, is the idea that, um, yes, we're not trading the gold itself, but there's gold in a vault somewhere backing up the money. And um, somebody could go and make the trade, right? You can ask your government to reimburse you with, with hard commodities instead of these paper bills, all right? And so finally, we could think about fiat currency. So, you know, most modern currencies, right? So um, we have US dollars, right? We have euros and maybe pound, Great, British, uh, Great Britain pounds, right? Um, most modern currencies, in fact, all of note are fiat currencies now. Okay. Now, an example of a double coincidence of wants problem. Okay, so um, we illustrated some of these in the uh, uh, that that example that we did in class, uh, where you guys were trading um, wheat or brick or ore, right? And sometimes we um, match and find a partner. Sometimes we don't, right? So um, with that in mind, right? Kind of following that example, let's suppose I have or and want wheat and you know this could happen in a settlers of Catan game right i guess they call it Catan now right so i have or and i want wheat um you have wheat but want i don't know um something else maybe wool Right. And so um, we can't trade here. Right. So, so the upshoot of this is we can't trade because there's only a single coincidence of wants. And so that's the problem. Right. A trade would be nice to do. It would make me better off. And it doesn't happen. So that's your double coincidence of wants problem. Right. So each needs to have what the other wants. And so our big idea, our big insight, right, is we're trying to solve this problem that each must have what the other wants for trade to be possible. And so we can introduce money instead. Right. So if we introduce money, we'll have only a single coincidence of wants. Everyone wants money. So in later rounds of that game where I introduced money, you didn't always succeed in trading, though many people did succeed, right? Um and so the, the reason for that is, you know, you still have to get lucky. You have to bump into someone who has something you want. But if you have money, you're gold. You can always buy if you want. Okay. Now, an example of a shoe leather cost. Okay. Um, so an ex uh, for an, as for an example of a shoe leather cost. Remember, these are the costs of cash management. So when we have high inflation, we have to do more cash management. And that's bad for society, right? And so um, uh, think about a case where um, if we have high inflation, I hold very little cash and so let's suppose that uh, uh well this happened to me right and we don't even even have that high inflation i just rarely hold cash but when i was at the conference right um uh 
the restaurant that uh, a number of colleagues and I went to didn't want to split the bill, which is very irritating because, uh, I mean, oftentimes people need receipts to get reimbursed for conferences, right? But anyway, um, they didn't want to split the bill. And so, you know, we worked it out, but um, I didn't have cash on me, right? So I have to figure out how, to, like, what to do. Like, can I Venmo you or in all this, right? And so um, maybe I'm uh, I'm holding very little cash. I'm walking along the uh, the street. Um, I see something I want to buy. And so now I need to run to the bank to get cash. And so this is a problem, right? That's your that's your shoe leather cost. I'm having to take extra steps. Um, in a normal environment, I might just have cash in my wallet, but I'm avoiding doing that because of the high inflation. So it's inducing extra effort, extra cost from me. Yes? Good. Okay. How about a capital gains tax distortion? Okay, so we want to talk through the story here, all right? Um, and so um, what's happening here? Well, again, this is a story about inflation being high. When inflation is high, the nominal interest rate is eventually driven up, right? Because I is equal to R plus pi. Okay. Now, uh, when that happens, Right, we know that the nominal interest rate is taxed, right? And so, um, taxes on interest income are going to increase because nominal interest is taxed, even though the real interest rate probably stays the same, especially in the long run. And so, then what happens? Well, um, this means the after-tax real interest rate is going down because these taxes are going up. And the after-tax real interest rate is the one that motivates me to, to purchase, right? To, to, to buy investment goods, to invest in my business, to buy factories, to buy machines, right? And so... Um, the way that we structure the tax system allows inflation to distort this really important mechanism in the economy, right? Um, we're distorting the thing that the solo growth model is pointing to as the big source of growth, right? Um, investment in our economy is going to decrease because of inflation, because after-tax real interest rates might be pushed down. So be able to tell the story. Right, you know, it's not just um, it's not it's not just um, you know, seeing some of these variables, but we really want to uh, talk about cause and effect, this chain of causation, which eventually might lead to um, and uh, you know, this after-tax real interest rate going down, and um, um, and uh, well, I was saying investment, so maybe savings in that case would go down. Right, so that could be the problem that we run into. Okay, now, um, commodity money, right? So an example of commodity money. Well, uh, we actually did that up above, right? So, so um, you know, think about uh, canned fish and POW camps, right? Uh, prisoner of war camp. So back in World War II, right, the Allied soldiers, uh, soldiers would get these Red Cross packages if they were um, in an enemy uh, prisoner of war camp. They were captured, right? And so um, they can't use dollars. Those would have been confiscated, but um, they can trade uh, the canned fish in their, um, in their Red Cross package as money. Okay. Okay, how about money that's in M2? but not in M1, right? So we could think about saving, money in your savings account. We could think about money markets, right? Or um, 
some of these uh, small denomination um, time deposits. So these aren't checkable, right? And so they're not in M1, but they are in M2. Okay. Um, and again, you know, hot, hot tip, uh, M2 is probably the more relevant uh, way to look at the money supply for most contexts. So keep that in mind. Okay. And a checkable deposit. Well, your checking account, right? Your debit card, your checking account. is checkable, right? And so um, you can immediately withdraw funds. You can order your bank to withdraw from funds from that account and place them somewhere else. So this is very fast money, right? Um, so this is an M1, okay. So I kind of like these questions. You might see something like this on the exam where we just give different examples of things, right? That can be a nice um, and a nice approach to some very short answer questions. All righty. So we're told the money supply is $10 trillion. Money base, 5 trillion. Currency ratio, 20%. And we'd like to know what the reserve to deposit ratio is. Okay, so, um, you know, I don't have any sort of mental map for handling this problem. I just kind of need to blunder around until I run into something. But I do know some logical ways to start. So it's really a good idea to start with some equations, right? We know the money supply M is currency plus deposits. We know the money base B is currency plus reserves. That's got to get me somewhere eventually, right? Um, okay. Um, I'm told something about the currency ratio. So uh, currency is little c times deposits. And I'm asked for the reserve ratio. Well, reserves are little as the reserve ratio times deposits. And I'm sorry, up above, currency ratio, CR, right? Times deposits is currency. Okay, so maybe this is something. Um, let's think. Well, um, again, just kind of blundering about, what if I subtract M minus B, right? So therefore, the currency cancels out on that right-hand side, and we'll end up with deposits minus reserves. Can we see that? So that's coming from those first two equations that I wrote. Okay. Um, so um, we know that m, m minus b is 5 trillion, right? We can plug in there. Um, 10 minus 5 is 5 trillion, so that's D minus R. Okay, what else do I know? All right, well, maybe I start to use that currency ratio. And I think a logical place to do that would be here, right, on that first equation. Why? Well, if I start with M is equal to C plus D, with the currency I, ratio, I can rewrite that as M, which I know, 10 trillion, is equal to um, currency, which is currency ratio 0 0.2 times deposits D plus D. So I can figure out what deposits are. That seems powerful. That seems like a good place to start. Okay, so um, I have 10 trillion is equal to 1.2 D, and D would be 1 point, uh, so, so D would be, uh, excuse me, 10 over 1.2. And so we uh, take out our handy dandy calculator, see if you can beat me. Yeah. Um, so 10 divide by 1.2. I had a misclick. So be careful when you use your calculator. So 1.2, there we are. Uh, so this is coming to 
uh, eight and a third, eight point three three. So that's my deposits. Okay. Now we want reserves, right? We want to know about reserves, and so um, if I go back here, right, I have. Five is equal to 8.33 minus reserves. Would be a useful thing to know. So reserves must be 3.33. I'm doing a bit of algebra there. So we're so close. The reserve to deposit ratio is going to be RR is equal to reserves divided by deposits. So 3.33 divided by 8.33. And again, your calculator might come in handy here. And so uh, this is going to be equal to 0.4. So people are uh, banks are holding forty percent of incoming deposits back as reserves. They're playing it pretty safe. So here's our answer. Right, this is the reserve ratio, and that solves the problem. So again, you know, um, kind of meandered about. I had a bit of a false start here, but it was useful in the end. So just keep banging on these things, right? Eventually the answer falls out, right? And so just, you know, stay confident. You know the equations. Just um, try to go about solving them in a reasonable way. Line up your equations um, and, uh, and solve. Okay. Now, in the same example, how much currency is held in the economy? Well, this should be relatively easy to find, right? We, uh, it looks like we haven't got it yet, but we ought to be real close. So uh, two ways uh, pop up to mind to find this thing. I could use that top equation here. Money supply is currency plus deposits with my deposits. That's probably the easiest way. I could also multiply the currency ratio times deposits, but I'm going to go with that first option. <coughs> Excuse me. So I know the money supply is currency plus deposits. And so money supply is 10 trillion. Plug in in red. Currency is what I'm looking for. Deposits eight and a third. And so um, currency is therefore going to be one and two thirds. Trillion dollars. That one was easy. No trouble there. And what is the value of deposits in our economy? All right. Well, Deposits, we've already found that, right? So doing all this work up above actually, you know, gave us a lot of help, right? It's, this uh, um, carries us through. So we found deposits already. Um, deposits, D, are eight and a third trillion dollars. That one, we already did the work. Okay. Now, finally. The Fed increases the money base by $1 trillion. What happens to the money supply? Well, this question should conjure in your mind ideas about the money multiply, right? Little m, right? So little m is 1 plus the currency ratio divided by currency ratio plus reserve ratio. That's our equation and we have this stuff all right we have currency ratio we have reserve ratio right and so um let's plug in right so this thing m 
is going to equal one plus currency ratio. Sorry, I got to find it again. That was 20%, 0.2, Divide by currency ratio 0.2 plus reserve ratio. We found that to be 0.4. So this is equal to 1.2 divided by 0.6 or two is our money multiplier. And so we're taking this $1 trillion change in the money base, multiplying by two to get a $2 trillion change in money supply. Good, good. Okay. Now, let's suppose that money demand depends on the real interest rate. So this is not, um, and, and I beg your pardon, let's suppose it depends on the nominal interest rate, even better. Yeah. Um, which is what we discussed in class. So this is not quantity theory. Um, this goes a little bit beyond. It makes this other very reasonable um, assumption that, that people actually care what these interest rates are when they choose saving and investment decisions, right? That's going to affect my demand for money. Okay, so explain how the Fed announcing that it will increase the money supply would affect money demand and the price level. Okay, so here, it's important to note that the Fed does not change the money supply yet. They merely announce an intention of doing so. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, again, we need to tell the story, right? So much of economics in general, just being able to explain the model in economic terms, so explain how behavior is going to be affected, explain how these processes work, right? So, so give me the function. Okay, so um, we'll start. If people announce, uh, if people see this increase in the money supply coming down the pipeline. They say, I know what that means. If you increase the money supply, I know that in the long run, inflation is equal to money growth minus GDP growth, and you're boosting this thing. So inflation's going up. So people expect more inflation. Okay. So. When I expect more inflation, I can run that through the Fisher equation. So we say R is equal to I minus and you know real interest rates are kind of steady right yeah, at least in theory right um and so uh we can rewrite this i is equal to r plus pi and so with people expecting more inflation maybe this is a pi e for expectations with this going up nominal interest rates go up and demand for money goes down, right? When nominal interest rates go up, the demand for money goes down, right? Um, so that's just something we, we know to occur, yeah? Um, this is the opportunity cost of holding money. So um, the demand for real money is going down. But how can we justify that, right? Remember, Money supply didn't change. M didn't change. It's only money demand that's changing. And so therefore, what must happen? Well, it, this change must be coming through P, right? If this thing is going down, that must mean that P is going up. That's the only way to explain it because the Fed hasn't changed M, not yet, right? Maybe eventually, but not yet. Okay, so what we're saying here is if we look at our demand for real balances,
this change in the Fed's messaging increased I, and it can't change M, so it has to decrease the price. Uh, excuse me, it has to increase the price less. So increase I, decrease L, increase the price. And Bob Sherrock. Okay, very good, very good. All right, now let's suppose the natural rate of unemployment is 4%. Okay, so the natural rate of unemployment, the unemployment rate that I expect in steady state, I'll call it U star, is 4%. Each week, 2% of workers are separated from their jobs. So each week, 2% of workers are separated. So S is 2%. What percentage of unemployed people find jobs each week to get this natural rate to make sense? Okay. So uh, the equation that we need for this is U over L, the unemployment rate. Sorry, U over L. <laughs> The, um, uh, so this unemployment rate is equal to S over S plus F. Okay. So we know this thing is 4%. We know S is 2%. 2% here and F is my variable. Okay. And so doing some rearranging, I could write this as 2% plus F is equal to 2% over 4%. And so thus F is equal to So we have 2% uh, over 4%, which is 0.5 or 50% minus 2%. So 48%. And Bob Jerk. Okay. So just a bit of algebra. All right. And confirm that you can do those. You know, feel free to write out the steps. You know, that's never a bad decision. Okay, so um, this should, you know, put you on your way to studying, you know, treat this as a complement to studying, not a substitute. So definitely look over um, resources on Moodle, you know, look at exercises in the book, uh, re-look at your, look at your old homeworks, right? So those are all good ideas to do. And if you have any questions, swing by office hours once you guys are back from spring break and, you know, back to the grind, right? So uh, thank you all very much for joining and uh, watching this video. If you have any questions on it, uh, send me an email, let me know. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all um, when we get back uh, uh, after, after spring break. So thank you all very much. Well done.